something that I have tried to avoid talking about. But if I'm going to do 88 counties, I'll talk about Pike County. And I cannot talk about Pike County without talking about the Piketon Massacre. I am Bill Swafford, and this is Murderers in Ohio. So we got a killer on a hill. Eighty-eight counties of murderers in Ohio continues on Pike County. The case that I am going to talk about is something that I have tried to avoid doing an episode on. The only reason for that is that there is already a great podcast dedicated just to this story. That podcast is called The Pike Massacre. Make sure that you go check it out. Before I begin, I will have to say that I will have to do this in a couple of different parts. There is just too much information with this case to put into one episode. Now, once I've decided to talk about this story, I knew that I need to make sure that my opinion is put in. And hopefully by the end of this, I have something for you that you might not have heard from any other podcast. And I need to do this without stepping on any toes of any other podcast or podcast host. This podcast, Murderers in Ohio, is about convicted murderers in the state of Ohio. Jake Wagner took a plea deal and admitted to murdering five people. Jake is now a convicted murderer in the Buckeye State of Ohio. So Jake Wagner is on the list for the Murderers in Ohio podcast. I have honestly been interested in what happened in Piketon, Ohio since the first time I heard about it. There is a whole lot to this. There's a lot of theories that surrounded this whole incident. What happened in Piketon in April of 2016 would put all eyes on Pike County, Ohio. Eight family members were shot and murdered execution style in one night. It leads to a two-year-long investigation. Then six members of another family would be arrested for this crime. Four of those family members face charges with death penalty consequences. So with all that being said, let's get this started. Pike County is only a Kentucky state line. It is south of Chillicothe and of Columbus and is west of Cincinnati. There are only three corporated cities in Pike County. They are Waverly, Piketon, and Beaver. There are some smaller unincorporated townships in Pike County, like Starkdale and Jasper. The city of Waverly is the county seat with around 27,000 residents. Piketon, the town we are going to talk about, has only a little over 2,000 residents. The unemployment rate is high in Pike County. There is not a lot of good job opportunities around the county. If there was more job opportunities, it doesn't appear to be a bad area to live in. We all know how things can change overnight. There was a night in April of 2016 that would change the town of Piketon forever. Now, April in Ohio means the start of spring, saying goodbye to the cold and snow. Summer is not too far away. Springtime can feel like a time for new beginnings, a new start. April was a month for something new for the Roden family. It was around April 16th or 17th of 2016 when 19-year-old Hannah Roden gave birth to her second little girl. Even though Hannah didn't know who the father was, it was still a happy time for the Roden family. Hannah Roden was a decent looking young girl with dark, long hair. Hannah and her two daughters lived with her mom, 37-year-old Dana Roden, and also Hannah's brother, 16-year-old Chris Roden Jr. They lived in a home on Union Hill Road in Pike County. Chris Roden Sr., Hannah's father. Dana and Chris Roden Sr. was married for 22 years but had gotten a divorce. Dana and Chris still stay close together. Chris actually bought Dana her home on Union Hill Road. Chris Sr. also had a place on Union Hill Road not too far 
Chris had a mobile home on a piece of land that was also shared by a barn, some junk cars, and another home. In this other home lived 20-year-old Frankie Roden and his fiancée, Hannah Gilly, and their two small children. The Roden family stayed close to each other. It was all about family. Were they a horrible family? No, they were not a horrible family. The Rodens did not deserve what happened to them on April 22nd of 2016. Now Hannah has a two and a half year old daughter named Sophia that she has custody over. Sophia's dad is 24 year old Jake Wagner. Jake Wagner is average height with dirty blonde hair. Hannah met Jake when she was only 13 years old. Hannah and Jake, who was almost 18 at the time, had started dating. It was young love. They had a daughter together. They had plans of getting married. They had wedding rings tattooed to their fingers. But it did not work out like the two had hoped. Jake Wagner had kept up hope that Hannah and him would eventually get back together. Soon realized that the family life that he wanted would never happen. Sometime on the day of April 21st, Jake goes over to Hannah's house and picks up his daughter Sophia. If someone didn't know any better, one would think that Jake was picking up his daughter to help relieve the stress off of Hannah, you know because Hannah was dealing with a four-day-old baby and was still trying to heal up herself. At first, people were unsure of why Jake had picked up his daughter at this time. But, whatever the reason was, Sophia had gone to spend some time with her dad, Jake. The events of what actually happened throughout the night of April 21st and into the early hours of April 22nd are still unknown to the public. There are still court trials that are still ongoing. I can talk about what is known about the morning of April 22nd, the morning that law enforcement in the town of Piketon would discover that they had killers on the run somewhere in Pike County. At 7.51 in the morning of April 22nd, 911 received a call from Bobby Joe Manley. Bobby Joe is Dana Roden's sister. Bobby Joe told 911 that she had gone into Chris Sr.'s house. Chris and his cousin Gary Roden looked like they had been beaten and were dead. The 911 operator had made sure to tell Bobby Joe to go outside of the house and to not let anyone inside. There is something I heard in the 911 call that I have questions about. I will ask these questions later on. But what I heard was, had been locked, but she had known where the key was, and that she had gone there to feed the dogs. I will talk more about those two things later. While Bobby Joe was waiting outside for law enforcement to show up, she had gone next door to Frankie's house. Bobby Joe wanted to check on Frankie and his fiance to let them know what was going on next door with Frankie's dad. This is something that anyone would do in this situation. Someone would want to go check on their nephew and let them know what is going on, especially if they lived right next door. Once Bobby Joe was at Frankie's place, she first saw Frankie's three-year-old son. It is said that the three-year-old told his aunt that him and his dad was playing zombies. They had been fans of The Walking Dead. Bobby Joe picks up the three-year-old and goes looking for Frankie and his fiance. Bobby Joe finds two more victims, Frankie Roden and Hannah Gilly, who were in their bed with their six-month-old baby, who had been left unharmed. At this point, there are four victims in two different homes. Four victims of the same family found by Bobby Joe. By this time, Bobby Joe had to have been freaking the hell out. Bobby Joe keeps her composure and calls her brother. Bobby Joe tells James about what is going on at Chris Sr.'s and Frankie's places. James then goes and checks on his sister, Dana Roden. 
James discovers two more victims, his sister and niece, Dana and Hannah Roden. It did not take long for the media to pick up this story, and the town of Piketon soon found out that six people of the same family had been murdered. Law enforcement and some other people noticed that 16-year-old Chris Roden Jr. could not be found. Chris did not appear to be at his home with his mom and sister, and Chris Jr. had not showed up at school. Law enforcement did say that at first they did look at Chris Jr. as a possible suspect in the murders. This is only because they did not know his whereabouts at the time. This is nothing out of the normal. Law enforcement has to look at everyone and consider everything in a situation like they are dealing with. Besides that, Pike County Sheriff's Department could not have been prepared to deal with these horrible murders in three different locations. At some point in the day, law enforcement would go over the crime scene at Dana Roden's house. This was a few hours after receiving the first 911 call. They would soon find the body of 16-year-old Christopher Roden. All this would be overwhelming for most small sheriff's departments. They had three crime scenes to go over, with seven victims. Where would a person even start with an investigation into something this horrible? The questions were only beginning to stack up. The afternoon of April 22nd would only bring more questions. 911 operators would receive another call. At 1.26 p.m., Donald Stone would call 911 while he was at his cousin's house. 44-year-old Kenneth Roden was the eighth and final victim. Kenneth Roden lived on Union Road, not the same as Union Hill Road, in a small township outside of Piketon. This all would be the start of the largest homicide investigation in the state of Ohio's history. It would take up to two years till arrests would be made. A lot of things would happen within those two years. The Pike County Sheriff's Office would need some help. They had eight victims of one family, murdered execution style, at four different crime scenes, and three young children left alive. Hannah's newborn baby, along with Frankie and Hannah's six-month-old baby, went into protective services. Frankie's three-year-old, which Frankie had with another lady, the three-year-old's mom got custody over him. She was not involved in the murders. When I first heard about what happened to the Roden family, I figured there had to be multiple people involved. It would take a highly trained individual to do something like this alone. Of course, many theories would build up over the next two years about this. This had to have been of something that was very well planned out. I mean, let's think about this. A group of killers, whatever, a group of killers, go on a killing spree, a one-night killing spree, and take out eight members of one family. This was very well thought out. The people of Piketon were in shock and were starting to get scared. Law enforcement had no idea who could have pulled off such a horrible crime. When I scan over this area with Google Maps, the homes of Union Hill Road are not all bunched together. There wouldn't be too many neighbors around to hear any gunshots. At this time, they did know that the eight victims had been shot to death. There were people from Piketon and surrounding areas that had put up reward money for any information that led to the arrest for the Roden murders. Donations were being given to help bury all eight members of the Roden family. 
I would like to put in real quick that the eight bodies were sent to Hamilton County Coroner's Office in Cincinnati. I'm not sure why the bodies were sent to Hamilton County, which is several counties west of Pike County. I'm sure it was because Hamilton County was more equipped to deal with that many victims at that time. Pike County does have its own coroner's office, but Pike County is not heavily populated, so it doesn't have all the resources and equipment that a bigger county would have. At this time, Ohio's governor, Mike DeWine, was attorney general. Mike DeWine would make an announcement that would add to the investigation and change how some people viewed the Roden family. On April 24th, Mike DeWine said that five search warrants had been executed, but not give the locations. The biggest thing that DeWine said at this time was that law enforcement had in fact found marijuana grow operations at three different rodent homes. I don't believe that I have seen or heard what locations these grow operations were at, but I am going to take a guess. I am going to say two were at Chris Sr. and Frankie's places, which both homes set on one piece of property. I would say the third would be at Kenneth Roden's place. Once people heard about the marijuana grow operations, it changed how some people felt about the Roden family. The reward money that people had put up was taken back. Donations for the family had stopped coming in. I think it is awful that the reward money was nations had stopped coming in. No matter what these people were involved in, they did not deserve to get murdered like they did. Plus, it is disrespectful to the family members of the victims. The grow operations helped spark theories that a rival grower or possibly the cartel could have been involved. A big murder like this could lead to the cartel, but the cartel more than likely would not have left the young children alive. The area where Chris Sr. and Frankie lived is not a heavy populated area. If a person who knew what they were doing and took the right steps, a good sized grow operation could be done in this area, whether it be an outdoor or indoor grow operation. I do wonder what other Roden family members knew about the grow operations. Gary Roden, Chris's cousin, had to have known something about the marijuana. Gary did not live with Chris, but he would sometimes stay at Chris's place. They were close to each other. Most good-sized grow operations are done by at least two or more people. Now, who was all involved with the grow operations might not have anything to do with the murders but I am left with questions about this part of the Rowan's life. One question is, who are the people that knew about the grow operations outside of the family? Did Jake Wagner know about this grow operation? This also has me questioning the first 911 call. The first 911 call was made by Bobby Joe Manley, Dana Rowan's sister. Bobby Joe would be Chris Roden's ex-sister-in-law. Two things about this call caught my attention. Bobby Joe said that the door had been locked. Did the killer lock the door? Did the killers enter the home in a different way? Then while on the phone with 911, Bobby Joe said that she was there to feed the dogs. Why was she there at her ex-brother-in-laws to feed the dogs. I think about this because we're talking about a place where two grown men are at. Two grown men who can feed the dogs on their own. Why was it necessary for Bobby Joe to go and feed Chris's dogs on this day? Now there are reports of guard dogs being on several of the properties. So my main question is, how much did Bobby 
Law enforcement would question Bobby Joe and James Manley, Dana's siblings. They would be questioned a few times. Bobby Joe took a couple polygraph tests, which she passed. I would like to point out that law enforcement always questions whoever it is that discovers a body. This is a routine with any law enforcement department. On April 26, a partial autopsy report was released to the public. This did not sit well with some news media. They wanted to know everything. There was two lawsuits filed to release full autopsy reports. At that time, Attorney General Mike DeWine said that the full reports could not be given out at that time because it could be harmful to their investigation. Basically, they believe that there is something in that report that only the killers would know. The media knows that every little piece of information cannot be given out while an investigation is in process. I believe that these two lawsuits cross a line with respect for the victims and respect for the investigation. There is a little bit of what everyone knows about the partial autopsy reports. All eight victims were shot execution style. Chris Roden Sr. was shot nine times. His wounds were to his head, torso, and forearm. Some people believe that the shot to the forearm was a defensive wound. It was possible that Chris had seen his attackers and put up his arm when the killer had fired the gun. Chris's body shows signs that it was already decomposing. This would be a sign that he was the first victim. That would mean the second victim would have to have been Gary Roden. Gary was shot three times in the head. One of the shots had left a muzzle stain. A muzzle stain is left when the killer has the gun very close to the victim's skin. Very close range. The next two victims had to have been Frankie Roden and Hannah Gilly. The young couple was found in bed. Frankie had three gunshot wounds to the head, and Hannah Gilly was shot five times to the head and face. Frankie and Hannah's six-month-old baby was found in the bed with the bodies. Thankfully, the baby was unharmed. The killers would have stayed on the same road which was Union Hill Road, and would have gone to Dana Roden's house next. Dana Roden was shot five times in the head and neck. Chris Jr. was shot four times, twice in the top of his head. Hannah Roden was shot twice in the head. Hannah was found in her bed, holding her five-day-old baby. Thankfully, the baby was left unharmed. The autopsy report also revealed that some of the victims were beaten. To me, the fact that someone would beat someone after they were shot shows that there was some kind of rage involved. I mean, that would take some rage to do something like that after your victims were already dead. And they would have already been dead because these victims were shot in their bed. I think it was Chris Roden Sr. I think that there were signs that he or Gary had possibly been drugged through some part of the house. Now the last victim, Kenneth Roden, the one victim that had the dollar bills just thrown all over top of the body, he was shot nine times. He was also shot in the head. All these murders were vicious horrible. There was rage involved. This was personal. But how personal was it? Was the motive simply as something as what the prosecutors are now saying as a custody battle gone really, really bad? I don't know. There is still more to this. There's still more opinions that I would like to give about that motive and what's going on. Another thing that happened on April 26, four days after the murders, 
The victims' bodies were released to the families. This had to have been a really hard time for the surviving rodent family. Funeral services would be held for six victims on May the 3rd of 2016. Now, I don't understand why investigators chose the time that they did, but during the funeral services, law enforcement had towed four vehicles from the crime scene. I'm not sure of the reason why investigators had impounded the vehicles that belonged to some of the victims. I guess this was to start the process of preserving the evidence. There was a lot of evidence that the investigators would have to preserve. Four cars that had been towed away on the day of the funeral services would not be the last things to be hauled off of the road properties. It would take a lot of investigators to go over four crime scenes that happened on the same night. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of evidence to process, to preserve, and to think about. Of course, the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation would get involved. There would be investigators put on this. Several different sheriff departments would get involved with this investigation. This would be the largest homicide investigation in Ohio's history. And still to this day, in the year of 2022, there are still two pending court trials on this murder case. As things were being removed from the road and properties, they partially opened the road back up. Once the road was fully reopened, there was still patrol cars sitting in different spots of the road. Law enforcement had four crime scenes and a lot of evidence to protect. I said in part one that on May 3rd, funeral service for six of the rodent victims were held. And while these services were being held, law enforcement would start removing some of the vehicles off the rodent properties. Vehicles were not the only things towed off the property. Around the middle of May, family members of the rodents' victims noticed that the mobile homes were being towed off the property. Law enforcement would remove four mobile homes, a bunch of vehicles, and tractors. This was all done to preserve the evidence. I think that this was a smart decision or a bad decision. I believe that this was a smart decision because all the area where the homes were at, this area is what a person might refer to as a backcountry road, not too many neighbors around. It would be easy for a person to get into this property unnoticed if it wasn't watched 24 hours a day. If evidence is not watched 24 hours a day, there is a greater possibility of evidence being stolen or planted in some cases. So this was a smart ideal. But not all smart ideals are the best ideals. I mean, this could have been a bad decision because all of the evidence inside of the mobile homes getting shooken around as the mobile homes were being transported to an impound lot. Everything that was taken from the road and properties were taken to the city of Waverly in Pike County. Everything was taken to some kind of a warehouse. The mobile homes and vehicles were kept outside in an outdoor lot. This lot was surrounded by a fence. A couple of investigative reporters had gone to the lot to check out the place and see how things were being handled. What they had found at the warehouse impound lot wasn't good. There was no law enforcement at this impound warehouse. There was no one there watching over the evidence. They had four crime scenes surrounded by just a fence. I'm talking about a normal six to eight foot high fence, no barbed wire. This is a prosecutor's nightmare. This could destroy a case before they even have a case. The fact that there was no law enforcement watching over this impound warehouse leaves a huge opening for any defense team to come into a courtroom and say that all that evidence they had was no good. The evidence cannot be trusted because it was not fully watched over 24 hours a day. 
any good lawyer would call out law enforcement on this huge mistake. I would like to think things happened this way with the impound lot because Pike County didn't have a lot of officers. But I do remind myself that the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation helped out Pike County. Not only them, but also the FBI, the DEA, and other multiple sheriff departments in Ohio. They had ways to take better care of the evidence. A lot of people would end up questioning how Pike County law enforcement was handling this investigation. And not only this investigation, but other homicide cases in Pike County as well. While all this was going on, there were other things going on as well. Six days after the Roden family murders, Jake Wagner files for custody for Sophia and of Hannah's newborn baby. This did not look good on Jake's behalf. A lot of people thought it was too soon for him to file for custody over his daughter and of the newborn baby that might not even be his. I am kind of 50-50 on this. As a father, I can see Jake wanting to be with his daughter and not wanting his daughter to get too far into the court system. It's hard for me to say that he looks like a suspect in the murders because he filed for custody right away. Who knows what the appropriate amount of time is in a situation like this. At the time, no one knew who was the father of Hannah Roden's newborn baby. There were three men who could have possibly be the father. Jake. Hannah and Jake did end their relationship. It is said that Jake still had kept hope that they would get back together. Hannah, she had started dating someone else. This guy was Charlie Gilly. Charlie was Hannah Gilly's brother and Frankie Roden's best friend. The relationship between Hannah and Charlie lasted for some time, but they had ended the relationship. Hannah did date another guy after Charlie, but I actually forgot the third guy's name. When Hannah had gotten pregnant with her second child, one of those two men and Jake Wagner were possibly the fathers of the baby. You might have noticed that I had thrown in Jake's name as a possible father of Hannah's newborn. There is a good reason why I did that. Even though Hannah and Jake were not still together, they still had some kind of sexual relationship. That right there shows a reason why Jake would believe that there was still hope for Hannah and him to get back together. In his mind, the fact that they were still having sex on occasions meant that their relationship was not over yet. People don't have sex with somebody that they are completely done with. With all that being said, there was a DNA test given to the three man and the baby. It turns out that Jake is not the dad and Charlie Gilly is the dad. Charlie got custody over Hannah's newborn baby. A year would go by and no arrest would be made. Law enforcement had no idea what the motive behind the execution of one family could be. The Pike County Sheriff's Department told the residents of Pike County to arm themselves. The theories of what happened to the Roden family would just keep adding up. The only theory that I would consider, if I did not know what I knew now, is the theory of a rival weed grower. Who were the other marijuana growers in or around Pike County at this time? Was the Wagner of way with marijuana? Did the Wagners know what the Rodens were doing? The Rodens did at times get along with the Wagners. Hannah and Jake's daughter tied the two families together. The Rodens had attended George Wagner's wedding. Two families went from being friends to one family being murdered and the other family that would soon be under law enforcement's radar for the murders. The Wagner family had been in Pike County for a few generations. The head of the Wagner family, I would say, is Federica Wagner. Federica is Billy Wagner's mom. 
that Rika and her husband, who is deceased, owns a large piece of land in Pike County. They run a couple of different farm businesses. They actually created their own breed of horses. They sell horses and other types of animals. Frederica built and funded a church for the community. She considers herself to be a God-fearing woman. However, this God-fearing woman has been accused throughout the years of doing shady business deals. Frederica had ran a nursing home and she was accused of taking advantage of people who could not help themselves. Now, Billy Wagner is a heavy set guy with some facial hair. Billy had been married to Angela Wagner for 20 years or more. Angela has long blonde hair and looks like a normal everyday mom. Billy and Angela have two sons. Both are in their mid-twenties at the time. George is the oldest son, with Jake being the youngest. George and Jake both have one child apiece. This is a family that proves the old saying right. Don't judge a book by its cover. You can look at this family and say that they might be a lower class family. The men look rough around the edges. They live in a county that has a high unemployment rate. But this family has some money. I will point out why I say this later on. The Roden and Wagner families were alike in some ways. They both were rough around the edges. They would do anything for their families. The Wagners and Rodens were the type of people who were not afraid to throw fists if they had to. An example of that would be Frankie and Chris Jr. They both loved the Demolition Derby. They even had people there that didn't like them so much. There was an incident between Frankie, Chris, and some of their friends. They had gone over to another driver's house. They had physically assaulted that person and that person's dad. So the rodents were no strangers to so-called street justice. Now at some point in time, I do know that Jake and his mom was questioned about the murders. I believe they both were interviewed a couple of times. After the murders, some say that Angela and Jake were emotionally upset about the murders. With everything that is known now about this case, it is hard to understand why they were emotionally upset. Were they upset that the rodents were dead? Or was it the feeling of guilt over what they had done to the rodents? Law enforcement would start to really focus on Jake Wagner and his family. This is why did it take so long for law enforcement to put some pressure and focus on the Wagner family. Usually during a homicide investigation, ex-boyfriends and girlfriends get focused on early on in the investigation. So to get back to the timeline of events, on May 12th of 2017, two warrants were executed on a 71-acre property that had been recently sold by Jake and his brother George. I cannot help but wonder what took investigators so long to go and search Jake's place. These search warrants were executed one year from the day that law enforcement started moving the mobile homes from the Rowan's properties. These two search warrants were done after Jake had sold the property. As an investigator, wouldn't you stand a better chance to get more evidence if the suspects still occupy the property? Someone who has not heard of this case might wonder why law enforcement really started to focus on the Wagners. There are a few reasons why this could be. There was an altercation between Chris Rowan Sr. and Billy Wagner a few days before the murders. No one knows what the argument was over, or at least no one will say why. This makes me wonder again about the marijuana grow operations, and who all knew what the Rowans were doing. Did any of the Wagner family members know about the Rowans grow operations? I also wonder how long the Rowans had been growing marijuana. After everything I know now, 
I also wonder if this argument between Chris and Billy maybe was over Hannah and Jake. Chris and Billy were both granddads to Hannah and Jake's daughter, Sophia. Someone who doesn't know this case may also wonder why Chris and Billy would argue about anything to do with Hannah and Jake. Hannah and Jake did have some problems over Sophia. In the state of Ohio, if a man and a woman are not married and have a child, a man has no rights over that child. All a man can do is pay child support and then pay a lawyer to go to court and fight for some custody rights just to see the child. It is said that there were times that things got heated up between Hannah and Jake over Sophia. But could this all really be over the custody of one child? I want to say something real quick about the property that was owned by Jake and his brother George. This was a 71 acre piece of land. How did two guys in their mid-twenties get their hands on a 71 acre piece of land? I say there is money in the Wagner family. Was this piece of land given to Jake and George by another Wagner family member? With that many acres, you're talking about a piece of property that could be worth a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Now, after law enforcement had searched the 71-acre property on May 13th of 2017, they still did not make any arrests, but looking into the Wagner family. The Wagner family obviously knew that law enforcement was looking into their family. The Wagner family would do something that would surprise law enforcement and the people of Pike County. Sometime in June, the Wagners packed up their things and moved to Alaska. I am not talking about one or two of the Wagners. I'm talking about Billy, Angela, George, Jake, and their children. This is a big move for the Wagner family to make, especially during a homicide investigation. Jake had been quoted in saying that they made the move to get Sophia away from everything that was going on with the media and the homicide investigation. But this did not work as they had hoped, because the National Enquirer found the Wagner family in Alaska. While they were up in Alaska, Jake Wagner had gotten into a relationship with a woman. Jake and this new woman eventually got married. Law enforcement kept up with her investigation. Law enforcement would take to the news media asking if anyone had any information on the Wagners. It was made clear that the Wagner family was law enforcement's top suspects in the execution-style murders of eight Roden family members. On April 22nd of 2018, two years after the murders, Mike DeWine and the county prosecutor made it clear that law enforcement was still working hard on the investigation into the Roden homicides. They were still focused on the Wagner family. They even had an office set up in the county where at least a couple of investigators were assigned. The investigators in that office were to stay focused on the investigation. There still had been no arrest up to this point. Member who actually had told the Wagners that they should move to Alaska. Some people thought the Wagners would get away from being arrested since they had moved there. But this move only helped the investigation because a month after this move, the properties where the Wagners had once lived. While up in Alaska, the Wagners all lived together in a double white trailer. Billy and Angela had even registered to vote. Jake had gotten a job and he still had his daughter Sophia. In spring of 2018, the Wagners would make another surprising move. The Wagners moved back to Pike County. But would the people of Pike County... The Wagners did not have a good homecoming. The people of Pike County had already convicted the Wagners. The Wagners ended up getting harassed by people. 
Angela had gone into a store one day with a bottle at her. People were not happy about the Wagners being back in Pike County. That would be Mike DeWine and law enforcement's fault. They had gone to the media asking for the public's information on the Wagners. By doing what they did, they publicly convicted the Wagners of the road murders. Sometime after the Wagners had gone back to Pike County, law enforcement would do another search warrant on the farm once owned by Jake and George Wagner. They somehow found more pieces of evidence yet there still was no arrest made up to this point. It was in October of 2018 when investigators said that they had gotten their last piece of physical evidence and that it had been tested. It would be a couple of weeks after this that there would be another big surprise in the investigation. On November 13th of 2018, four members of the Wagner family would be arrested for the execution-style murders of the eight Roden family members. Billy Wagner was found inside of a horse trailer on an interstate somewhere outside of Lexington, Kentucky. Angela was arrested in her home. Jake and George were out in a vehicle. Officers had performed a traffic stop on the two brothers and arrested Jake and George Wagner. Law enforcement now has the four people who they believe murdered eight members of the Roden family. However, they did make two more arrests. They arrested Billy Wagner's mom, Federica Wagner, and Angela Wagner's mom, Rita Newcomb. The last two arrests are surprising. One lady is in her mid-sixties, and Frederica is in her mid-seventies. How could two older ladies be involved in this horrible crime? I will talk more about that in a minute. Something I forgot to put in earlier is that after everything was removed from the property itself was released to the surviving family members. This in itself was another problem for the family. I will use Chris Sr.'s property as an example. They did not know who to release the property to. Chris's ex-wife, Dana, and their kids were dead. It would have to be taken to probate court to see what surviving family member was entitled to the property. There is so much information about this case that it is hard to keep everything in order. Something else I forgot to say in part one and in this episode is that there was evidence that the rodents were involved in cockfighting. Cockfighting is basically taking two male chickens, putting them in a small area, and have them fight while people stand around and take bets. There is a possibility that the rodents were involved with illegal cockfighting. There have been rumors of illegal cockfighting going on in northern Kentucky, and that decent money can be made from it. There is something else I will add in right now. There was a Roden family member that law enforcement had been watching. I forget who this person was. I know it was a male subject. They had put a tracking device on this guy's vehicle, which the guy had gotten arrested for removing the tracking device. You might be wondering why law enforcement would follow around one of the victim's family members. They had a good reason to follow and watch this guy. By going through Jake Wagner's phone records, law enforcement found out that this guy, a Rowan family member, had texted Jake Wagner the night of the murders. But they did not know what the text was about. This did not look good for that family member of the Rodens. Did that Roden family member tip off Jake to when the Rodens were home or asleep? It did bring up some questions and get the investigators' attention. Before I start talking about the charges that the Wagner family are accused of, I want to talk about what the prosecutor says is the motive behind the execution-style murders of the eight Roden family members. I have never fully supported the motive that the investigators are saying is the reason for these murders. 
Investigators believe that the Rowans were murdered over the cut Jake. Law enforcement believe that they have evidence to prove that the Wagner family killed eight members of the Roden family to get custody over Hannah and Jake's daughter, Sophia. I don't or cannot believe that this is the full motive behind the execution-style murder of another family. I have heard about custody battles going bad and possibly ending up in murder, but it's usually between two parents not between two families. And what about Kenneth Roden? Why go to Kenneth's place and kill him? Did the Wagners really think that there was a chance that Kenneth would get custody over Sophia after the Rodens had died? Then there's the fact that the Wagner family had some money. They had money for lawyers. I know in the state of Ohio it is very hard for a man to get custody of a child if that mom is being a good parent. But the Wagners had money for better lawyers. The Wagner family are not just a bunch of idiots. These people ran farm businesses and things. I find it hard to believe that all four of them Billy, Angela, George, and Jake sat down and agreed that the only way to get custody over Sophia was to kill eight people. They might have killed eight people, but behind what the Wagners had done on April 22nd, 2016. Alright, this is where I'm going to have to say that there is going to have to be a part three into the story behind Jake Wagner and the Python Massacre. There is just too much information to throw at at somebody all at once. And a person needs all of this information to fully understand the madness behind the murders, the madness behind the investigation. There are still two Wagner family members who still are standing trial for these murders. I want to go ahead and talk about the charges that the six Wagner family members were accused of. I will start off with Frederica, Billy Wagner's mom, and then Rita Newcomb, Angela Wagner's mom. Investigators believe that Frederica and Rita did not have any parts in the murders, but might have helped to try and cover it all up. 77-year-old Frederica Wagner was charged with perjury and obstruction of justice. Investigators believed that Frederica had misled them in their investigation. The investigators say that Frederica had lied about some bulletproof vests that she had bought online. That's right, you heard what I said. A woman in her mid-70s bought bulletproof vests online. There is nothing that looks wrong with that. Every grandma buys bulletproof vests for their families. How else are they expected to stay warm on those cold Ohio winter days? The courts did show mercy on Frederica and dropped the charges. Frederica had a receipt proving that she had bought the bulletproof vest after the murders, not before. I would still like to know why Frederica had bought the vest. Did she really buy the vest or just pay for them? And why after the murders? Was she afraid that her family would get into a shootout with law enforcement? Did the Wagner family receive any death threats? I know that the charges were dropped, but I still believe there is a reason behind the purchase of bulletproof vest. Frederica, I have to say she does not look like a nice friendly old lady, but apparently she got some money. Federica's farm sits on a 2,000 acre piece of property. Let me shine a little light on that. In 2020, the average Ohio farm real estate value for land and buildings is $6,300 per acre. So a 2,000 acre farm could be worth as much as $12.5 million. Even on a low end, let's say $1,000 per acre, we are still talking about a piece of property with a bare minimum value of $2 million. The Wagners could have sold some of that property off and taken Hannah Roden to court instead of killing her and her family. Even though the court had dropped the charges against Frederica, 
Investigators would not leave her alone. Law enforcement would serve a search warrant on Frederica's 2,000-acre property. Angela Wagner's mom would have her time in the Pike County Courts. Rita was charged with perjury, obstructing justice, and forgery. Rita had testified that she had signed some papers about custody over Sophia when she did not actually sign the papers. The papers that the courts are referring to is some paperwork that has to do with custody of Sophia. These documents were supposedly made up sometime before the murders. This paperwork was found in one of the Wagner's homes. This paperwork had gotten the investigators' attention because the paperwork was about who would get custody of Sophia in the event of Hannah Rowan's death, which the paperwork said Sophia would go to Jake Wagner. To do this, they would have to have Hannah Rowan's signature and Jake Wagner's signature. Then a notary would have to witness it being signed. Then a notary would also have to sign and stamp the paperwork. A notary can only do stuff like vehicle titles and paperwork. Anyone could be in a notary. A person would just have to apply to be one. I believe notaries pay a fee also to keep their notary license. Rita fits into this because Rita was a licensed notary and her name was on the paperwork and investigators that she did in fact sign the custody papers. A handwriting expert would determine that Rita did not sign the custody papers. So why would she lie? Or better yet, who would she lie for? Of course, her daughter, Angela Wagner. I don't know how many people realize this, but law enforcement will record all calls in and out of jail. But the courts wouldn't have to worry about recorded jail phone calls because Rita told the courts that Angela had told her to sign the paper. Angela was trying to mislead the investigation while in jail. The courts did not let this continue. The courts took away Angela Wagner's phone call privileges while in jail. I still cannot buy into the Wagner's only motive behind killing eight members of the Roden family is only over the custody of Hannah and Jake's daughter. I can believe it being only Jake's motive, but Billy and George? What would it be? George had a young son he wanted to be around. Why would George give up the right to be around his own son just for Jake to be around and have custody over Sophia? I'm going to use myself as an example. I have a daughter. I was never married to her mom. But by Ohio's law, I have no rights over my daughter. I do see my daughter, but legally, I only have the right to pay child support. It sounds like a bad way to put it, but Ohio's court will force someone to pay child support, but then make that person fight for visitation, make that person hire a lawyer. I know that if I had ever come up with a plan like the Wagners did just for custody, I know not one of my family members would go along with it. Before I talk more about the charges they were facing, I want to say a few more things about the Wagners. So you can get a better understanding of the kind of people that they are. Law enforcement says that the Wagners were a cult-like family. They made a lot of their big decisions together as a family. People say that they were a family that kept their business to themselves. An outsider would never know the dark secrets behind the Wagner family. People say Angela Wagner seemed to be a loving and caring mom and grandma. After everything I have heard and read about Angela, a trolling person, she seems to want to have control over everyone in her family. Now some of the news media, before Jake was a suspect, had made Jake out to be a hard-working single dad who was just trying to survive. Now sometime after the murders, and I don't know whose ideal it was, it was either Jake's or Angela's ideal, but both were involved. Jake had set up a GoFundMe page. Jake was asking for donations to help with raising Sophia. I have to wonder why they did that. Was that done to help them look like they were innocent? Maybe it was a part of their plan the whole time. 
I want to do something that I don't think I've seen or heard anyone else do. And that is talk about Jake Wagner's and Hannah Roden's ages. Hannah was 15 years old when she had gotten pregnant and Jake was 20 years old. Now Jake did not ever get charged for having sex with a minor till he got charged for the age. This messes with my head. Law enforcement could have put Jake behind bars for sexual misconduct with a minor and kept him there while they did their investigation. So why didn't they do so? I also bring up the ages because in situations where the ages are that different, at those young ages, there is a higher chance of it being a controlling and at a very least mentally abusive relationship. 20 year olds are starting to think that they are making up their own rules, living their life how they want to live it. 15 year olds are still being told what to do by their parents, by their teachers, so they still got to do what they're told. So it can turn into a controlling relationship real quick. So now I will get back to why the Wagners were arrested and what charges they face. I did find a copy of George Wagner's original indictment. All four Wagners, Billy, Angela, George, and Jake, will have the same basic indictment. This is a 22 count indictment that is 52 pages long. To you the whole indictment because I would like to finish this at some point. The first count is for aggravated murder. It says that firearms were used and that silencers had been on the guns. A silencer is something that is put on the end of a gun barrel to muffle the sound. Wagners are accused of committing the murders with the plans of fleeing afterwards. First eight counts of the indictment are basically all the same. Each count is for each one of the victims. The indictment lays out the fact that the Wagners had started planning this murder since the beginning of January. The Wagners had spent four months planning on how to kill eight Rowan family members in one night. The indictment talked about trips to Walmart that the Wagners made. One trip they had bought stuff to make brass catchers for the guns. One trip to Walmart they had bought a pair of boots. They only bought the boots to frame James Manley, Dana Roden's brother. The indictment put out that the Wagners had basically been spying on the Rodens. The Wagners had hacked into some of the Rodens computers and phones. It almost sounds as if they were preparing to go to war with the Rodens. The Wagners had even stocked up on ammo. I heard talk about cameras being placed on the Rodens property. It could chance that the Wagners might have put some up. Or it could have just been a deer camera, which hunters used to determine which paths the deer are running. Or Chris Sr. could have put them up to watch over his grow operations. Once in a courtroom, all four Wagners, of course, pled not guilty. This would be the first time in Ohio that four people, not to mention of the same family, would face capital murder charges at the same time for the same case. All four Wagners will face the death penalty if convicted. The Wagners did sign away their rights to a speedy trial. This year is 2022. This April will mark six years since the Python massacre and two of the Wagners are still awaiting trial. The investigation into the Python massacre ended up being the largest homicide investigation in Ohio's history. 1,100 tips were received, 500 interviews that were done, 700 pieces of evidence that would be tested, 200 warrants and other things that would be served to people. It took a lot for the investigators to finally arrest Billy, Angela, George, and Jake Wagner. The prosecutor had the Wagners behind bars and they had to protect the case. The Pike County Sheriff got indicted on felony charges and removed from office. That could have hurt the prosecutor's case. It has been said that people really don't trust law enforcement in Pike County. Some people are scared of law enforcement in Pike County. 
A lot of people did not like how Pike County Sheriff's Office had handled the road murder investigation. Pike County has other unsolved murders and some murders that were done just like the Roden family. Then the county has its fair share of drug problems just like all the other counties in the country. The one over all of this is Pike County Sheriff, Sheriff Reeder. Sheriff Reeder was apparently a corrupt sheriff. Sheriff Reeder was sentenced to prison for three years for theft while in office and tampering with evidence. This could have been really bad for the prosecutor's case. Sheriff Reeder was the first person in lead of the investigation, and he still was sheriff when the Wagners had gotten arrested. This could have been really bad for the prosecutor's case. If the defense lawyers would prove that there was corrupt actions in the road or murder investigation, it could have destroyed the whole case. But none of that would matter because on April 22, 2021, five years to the day, Wagner would walk into a courtroom and surprise the world. Jake Wagner would take a plea deal, admit his guilt in killing five of the rodents. One of those five was 19-year-old Hannah Roden. In exchange for his plea, the courts took the death penalty off the table for all four of the Wagners. Jake will also have to testify against his mom, Angela Wagner, his dad, Billy Wagner, and his brother, George Wagner. Jake received eight consecutive life sentences, one life sentence for each victim. I was just reading something that says investigators first found evidence connecting the Wagners to the murders at a stop at a United States Canadian border check. They had found something on a Wagner laptop. Like I said, I'm going through some stuff, and somewhere I have said that Angela and Jake had been interviewed twice, two times apiece. I was wrong about that. They were both interviewed five times apiece between May 2016 and May 2017. Billy Wagner was interviewed three times between 2016 and 2017. George Wagner was interviewed in May. 2017. So their last interviews were a couple of months before the whole family had moved to Alaska. Tony Roan Sr. I don't know how he's related to the Roans, but Tony has sued the Wagners. That way the Wagners cannot benefit from the murders. Now after Jake's plea deal, Jake also leads investigators to some new evidence. It is said that Jake had gone through the whole night and told the prosecutors what had happened on April 22nd of 2016. So maybe once all the court trials are done, hopefully we will learn exactly what happened to the Rowan family. In September of Tiger appears in court, I don't think she looks the same as she did before. Angela took a plea deal to conspiracy to murder. Angela had helped plan the murders, but did not execute the murders. One thing that I am not clear on is who was watching Sophia. Did Sophia stay with Angela while Billy, George, and Jake went out to kill her mom and family? Do you think Angela would have taken off with Sophia if things had gone wrong with their plan and the men did not make it back? I hope that before another plea deal is given, that a full motive must be told by one of the Wagners. I still believe that there's still more to this than just custody over one little girl. In December of 2021, George Wagner was back in court. He was trying to get the court to drop the aggravated murder charges because it is documented that George did not murder anyone. The courts denied the request, and the charges still stand. The courts must still believe that George still helped involvement in them. I see it this way. Angela helped plan things out. George was probably the driver, and he possibly would have went in and watched his brother and his dad's back. And then the trigger men were Billy and Jake.
George's trial is set to start on April 4th of 2022. Billy Wagner still does not have a firm trial date set at the moment. It seems that Billy and his lawyers is still trying to fight some of the evidence. I don't understand how he's still trying to fight everything when his son and his wife have done taking plea deals. Billy was in a courtroom in November of 2021 for a motion hearing. Billy's defense team is questioning ballistic and a shoe print evidence that was found on the scene. Billy will be back in a courtroom in February of 2022 for a final pretrial hearing. I am wondering who will be next to take a plea deal, Billy or George. I hope for Sophia's sake that there is more to this than just custody over her. Sophia does not deserve to think that her mom and her family died because her dad wanted custody over her. I have finally come to the end of the case and I would highly suggest checking out the Python Master Podcast. It is a really good podcast. I have put a link to that podcast in the episode description of all three parts to this case. If anything new does come up, I will make sure to keep everyone posted. Make sure to subscribe to Murderers Ohio for that. As this comes to an end, I will leave you with a question. Do you think the Wagners had ever done something like this before? I am Bill Swafford. And this has been Murderers in Ohio.